Simon Brown here doing our last power hour for 2021 uh, and our second year of lockdown power hours. I'll come to that in a bit. As always, we end the year with me looking forward to next year, 2022, uh, but I'll kick off with, first of all, having a look, see at what I'd said a year ago so that there's some level of accountability. Um, but what I also do is I go on Twitter a, a, a day beforehand and I ask you folks what you expect from the year ahead, just for the top 40, keeping it simple. Uh, and this was your expectation a year ago. You said, what, almost two thirds of you said, it's going to be green, no stress, going to be a lovely year. Uh, and uh, today, pretty much we're getting the same story, uh, almost two thirds of you. Here's a fun fact. This is the eighth time that we have done this year end, and we've done the, the polling different ways. We've used Twitter. We've done show of hands at the venue. The wisdom of the crowds has always been right. Whatever the crowds have said has ended up what the market has done, sometimes not by a heck of a lot either direction. But nonetheless, that's just there for uh, some fun up front. So what were my predictions when I was looking forward to 2021? Uh, I expected the top 40 to be green as did the majority of you, uh, and it was 22%, nice year. Uh, I expected a stronger rand, and I thought that the commodity boom would really see that through. It did till June, and then PGMs came off the boil, iron ore came off the boil, coal, everything came off the boil. So actually, uh, the rand is uh, weaker by 4.7. 4 so I, I want to, expecting a US market screen, we got a chunky 29% there. However, I said I actually thought that the Russell 2000 would do better than the S&P. Fundamentally wrong on that. The Russell 2000 is the, the small and mid cap. It's literally 2,000 stocks in the index, sort of your mid and small caps out of the US. And I, it, it, it had been lagging for some time. And we hadn't seen through the, the, the pandemic, even ahead of the pandemic, 2019, 2020, it had been lagging. And the S&P had been pulled up by tech stocks sort of from 2019 last year and again this year. And I thought it was time that we would start to see those smaller, those mid caps starting to catch up, uh, but not happening. Uh, we got Bitcoin. I said Bitcoin was going to be boring. It, yes, it made a new all time high. That's lacquer. Uh, what it didn't do was uh, actually do what Bitcoin should do. Uh, it set the lights out, you know, not, knock it out. I don't know. 100% something. I'll talk more about crypto. Bitcoin becoming a bit of a has-been. I, I said uh, that Biden did win the election. Remember a year ago, there were bunches of folks who were saying, uh, no, he hadn't. He did. Trust me. He won it. Uh, I think I, I was worried about China. And the point being is that when, 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 with Biden coming in in January, the sense was going to be, cool, okay, now Biden's in, China and America can be best friends again. And I said, hang on, I'm not so sure. The distinction was going to be is that the negotiations between China and, and the US wouldn't happen on Twitter. They would happen in the old fashioned way of diplomats and presidents and everything else. Well and good. The trick being is I didn't expect it uh, uh, to come so much from China's side. Common prosperity, we'll talk about that. I was bullish emerging markets. They've done okay. They, they, they really have done okay. But, but they certainly, you know, if I'm bullish emerging markets relative to what? Well, then it has to be developed markets. No, I mean, Kakaron 40 beating it, uh, Spain coming out better. I mean, just uh, the, the emerging markets had green years, but they weren't as strong as I had expected them to be. I was calling for resource boom. Uh, we had seen the beginnings of it at the end of last year. It continued through to June and then it faded. What we're seeing in the space, I mean, to take the PGM miners, the, the results to, to June, those six months, January to June, was their best six-month period ever. Uh, July to December is going to be the second best period ever, but certainly we've come off the boil a bit there. Uh, I said no re rate increases in the US, the EU, and South Africa, two out of three, South Africa. And let's be fair to the Saab. A year ago, the Saab said uh, rate increase in the fourth quarter of this year, and I'm like, not going to happen. Well rate increase, fourth quarter of this year. Suppose when they're the ones doing it, don't underestimate them. Uh, I, I wasn't massively bullish on gold. It had done its story. That didn't thrill me. Uh, I said we were getting be getting vaccinated and I'll get my jab. Got him. Made the point, pandemic not over. We'll come more to that. Um, and I also said that one thing to have vaccines, it's going to be about poor nations, not 
yet getting, and that's certainly where we're sitting in. Uh, not a bad year, uh, in, in some ways better than many. It was in some ways a easier year because by the time in December of last year, we'd already seen the massive move off uh, the, the, the pandemic, the vaccines were rolling out at, at that point. I think there might have been a couple of jabs already happening in, in the US, uh, the UK, a chap called William Shakespeare, the first uh, British person to get vaccinated. There was uh, certainly optimism there, and there was something to underpin that optimism. This year, a little more tricky. The stocks I touched on uh, at the beginning of, of um, uh, uh, the, the presentation last year that I was looking for, so Citrix 40 benchmark, 24%, uh, only Afrimat underperformed that. This really was a year, you often hear this, the, the theory, it's, it's a stock picker. It's a stock picker's market. And, you know, there's, there's, there's broadly two types of markets, one where everything's moving up or down. And that's usually happening when it's on the downside. The flip side is where, yeah, there's things moving, but some are going up, some are going down, and you get a, an index, which is 24%, nice number, but you get a, a individuals that absolutely knock it out the park. We'll come back to some of these uh, uh, as, as we talk around them during the presentation. Um, certainly some of them still on my radar, some of them off the radar. Uh, PPC, the absolute standout winner, 552%. Um, and in fact, if you'd bought it earlier last year, if you'd bought it around September or so, at around 40 or 50 cents, it was a 10 bagger. Uh, it's timing. I take this from when I did the presentation last year to earlier this week. This has been, if you are, if, if you're in ETFs, that's cool. You did yourself 24% on the on the Satrix. You did 29 in the US. Add in a bit of currency weakness, you're probably 35% up. Maybe you had NASDAQ. But if you're moving from ETFs and you're also doing individual stocks and you didn't have a knockout year, you've truthfully got some hard questions to ask yourself um, because it, there were stocks out there that have done spectacularly well. And, you know, what, we've got one, two, three, four that are more than 100% up, uh, two in the 80s, uh, one more than 50, and then a, a, you know, Coronation 36, Omnia 38 are the laggers. Uh, Afrimat 23% up but didn't even beat the index. So some burning questions. Let's kick off with those, and then the second half we'll start touching on on what I'm looking for going forward. ESCOM. Uh, so, I mean, ESCOM just remains what it does best, right? Turning out the lights on us uh, repeatedly all the time and, and putting us back into darkness. The, 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 the problems with ESCOM are well known. I, 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 I'm not going to go into them. We can debate them. The private 100 megawatt license is a biggie. It, we're seeing not just the mines, everyone from Goldfields to to Sabania to Pan African Resources, who now installing their own power generation. Their payback period typically about three years. Uh, their timelines to get it up and running about six to months to a year, uh, depending on size and complexity. It's renewable. We're seeing shopping centres doing it. I think we're going to start seeing uh, and office parks. We're going to probably start seeing large residential uh, places do it. You know, if Baldwin's building a 1500 unit uh, uh, complex. Well, why not put a, I don't know, what do you need for that? A 20 or 30, probably costs, maybe it doesn't work there, but we're gonna see more and more of this. And that has two kickers to it. Uh, if we add into that with independent power producers and the latest round, which has been negotiated, uh, which adds about, what's it, two gigawatts of power into it, we can probably add a couple more gigawatts of power from private 100 megawatt and what that then gives us is by the end of 2023 so let's call it two years time we can probably have three to four uh, gigawatts of power on the grid every level of load shedding is one gigawatt so what you know, if we got say we've got four gigawatts that means no stage one two three or four load shedding it needs to be a whole lot worse uh, of course, this is solving the problem obliquely rather than solving ESCOM. And this, of course, has a problem with ESCOM. Goldfields has said they're going to save 125 million rand a year by creating their own power. Great for Goldfields, hmm, not so great for, for ESCOM. And it's not, ESCOM doesn't lose 125 million from, from Goldfields. They lose more because that's what Goldfields saves after CapEx, maintenance, 
et cetera, et cetera. So the, 100, the 120 watt is uh, uh, a big deal. Uh, so certainly that is, uh, it's going to solve our problem. Abu, you're asking, yes, we are recording. It will be online later, just one lap. Dot com. So it is a biggie. It kind of solves the problem. Still a couple of years away. The ESCOM problem has not gone away by any stretch of imagination. SA, the economy is in trouble. Short answer. And I stress, and I say this most times, the economy is not the market. Stock markets, economies, they're different beasts. We got GDP for Q3 on Tuesday. Uh, we'll probably be back at December 2019 levels, if not at end of Q3, then certainly by the end of Q, uh, fourth quarter. So we, 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 our economy will be, will be the same size as it was in December 2019. In other words, pre-pandemic. A lot faster than I thought would happen. I thought the U.S. would get there sort of maybe 2022, and we would get there 23, maybe 24. Uh, the U.S. would uh, there at the end of last quarter, uh, and uh, sorry, in, in mid-year. The rebound has been significant. But of course, for us, we're back at December 2019. That was hardly a massive achievement. I mean, what's our growth going forward? Around about 2%. I was uh, uh, chatting with Lao Sunka on my podcast. Uh, from PSG, and he's saying, look, they're actually expecting a surprise on GDP to the upside. What's that? Two and a half percent? You know, we've, we've got unemployment of 35 percent, uh, discouraged workers almost 50 percent. We have a, an economy that is at its core on its knees. The large uh, uh, listed companies, the banks, the retailers, you look at their results, you look at their operations, you wouldn't see it at all. You absolutely don't see it in those results, not whatsoever. But make no mistake, our, our economy, our small towns are decimated. Industries are in trouble. The SA economy is absolutely struggling. What needs to be done to fix it? We could spend hours debating that. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But as a given, our economy is really struggling. And it means when we are picking SA Inc. stocks, we really got to pick carefully those that are able to navigate the, the, the challenges within the market. Vaccines, we got them, nobody wants them. Weird. Uh, so hence we have a fourth wave, we have more lockdowns coming, uh, probably announced this Sunday, if not this Sunday, then next Sunday, uh, vaccine mandates, et cetera. Uh, this is how it's gonna roll. We've got the new variant, I'll touch on that in a, in a moment. But the, the, the big question a year ago was, vaccines are starting to come, and that's very, very lacquer, but are we going to get enough of them into the right parts? You know, it's South Africa. I, I, got, I, I got my second jab almost three weeks, sorry, almost three months ago. I didn't expect to get my first jab until sort of October, November, and the second jab maybe January. So, you know, I'm, I'm four months ahead of what I thought I, I would get. And that's unfortunately due to take up. Mandates work. We can see that around the world. It does increase the numbers. Uh, and ultimately, that is what the, the government's going to do in order to get currently we're at about what 36, 37% of adults are vaccinated. Uh, to get that number higher, we're going to have to mandate. The RAND, uh, that's a five-year chart, uh, which is 2.4% uh, weakness uh, compounded average growth per year. Which is, you know, when you look at the RAND and the volatility, and here we are down at 13.50, uh, sorry, 11.50, when Ramaphosa was sworn in. We have got the, the numbers there for, um, lot, uh, sorry, earlier this year, when the commodity boomed in 13.50, almost 19 during the height of the pandemic. And yet overall, our currency loses around 2.4% a year. And that is actually the long-term average. That number shouldn't surprise you. That is what our long-term average for the currency is running over a per, uh, uh, per year. Next year, so I was looking for a stronger round this year. It didn't happen. Uh, and you know, the, the, I'm blaming the commodities. Be that as it may, my look for next year, I'm not expecting a stronger round. I'm not expecting it to blow out. I'm not expecting it to go crazy. We're 1650, sorry, 1615, maybe we're 1650, 17 rand or there's about but without that underpin of commodities, unless the commodity boom can return, and that's PGMs, uh, iron ore will pick up a bit, yes, um, and that, that'll help. Uh, it's down at about $90 uh, a tonne. It was $220. Uh, that'll certainly help a bit. Coal, that might recover. I'm not expecting it. Coal's around the $90 to $100 uh, a tonne. I think that'll largely stay where it is. It's going to be those PGMs. 
And the PGMs is, can the motor manufacturers get chips so that they can build cars? Currently, Toyota is just uh, report expecting a 24% decline in production for 2021. And that's not because they don't have demand. It's because they don't have chips. And every time I speak to a, an expert and I say, when will this chip issue resolve itself? The answer is, in the next six months. They've been saying that now for 18 months. Top 40, uh, there's our collapse. I said it last year. If you joined the market after 2009, you'd never had a market collapse. And last year was your first. And, you know, welcome to your first collapse. Our five-year uh, KGAR uh, compounded annual growth rate, 7.7%. Mm. For an EM, it's not good enough. The the, the long-term KGAR on, on uh, developed markets, uh, the US, Europe, UK, is around seven, maybe eight. Uh, we should be doing better than that. We should be doing 10, 12, 14 percent, uh, if nothing else, because of our higher inflation. If nothing, take the inflation differential between us and them. Of course, right now, the US has higher inflation than, than we do. 7.7 is not stunning at all. Elections uh, last month, I couldn't remember when they were. You know what one of the things, and I think we gloss over it, is that our democracy works. And yes, there are always some people who say the elections were rigged, but no, they weren't. Our, our democracy works. We have now done it for 28 years, almost uh, 27 years, and it happens, it works. Uh, coalitions, our, 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 our electoral system is designed for coalitions. It's a proportional representation. It's designed for the coalitions as opposed to the UK or the US where it's your first past the post and therefore you typically get two, maybe a third party, but really just two parties who, who dominate the process. We more in Germany or in Italy. The question is, are our coalitions going to be Germany, stable and efficient, or Italy, crazy and drinking ouzo? Uh, Italy. If, you, if you're putting money on it, make it Italy. The DA is going to struggle in the metros they control outside of Cape Town because they don't have a formal coalition. And make no mistake, at some point, Action SA or the EFF is going to stand up and make demands the DA considers uh, unreasonable and it's going to collapse uh, processes and service delivery is going to be the victim. Bitcoin, still struggling to be anything useful unless you want moderately untraceable transactions. And what I mean by moderately is make no mistake, the FBI has got a map of the entire Bitcoin blockchain with every transaction. They might not know who that person is yet, but they start tagging you and they start putting it together. And then, and then in time, they put it all together. Uh, new highs, but not a bumpy year. It was a year of the altcoins. Ethereum did a whole lot better. But forget Ethereum, Polkadot, uh, Solana, and all those other sort of coins, which a year ago, we hadn't heard of. It was absolutely the altcoin year. Now, here's my problem. They're using the blockchain technology. They're faster, more efficient, and cheaper, and less energy intensive than Bitcoin. That's excellent. But are there not going to be altcoins to the altcoins in a year or three or five? The answer is yes. So how do you pick the winners? Well, you buy yourself a basket. Uh, EC10, which is owned 50% by Easy Equities. Revix has got a couple of different baskets that you can buy. Buy yourself a basket. The, 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 the market cap weighting baskets, at one point Bitcoin was 85%. Now it's down. I think it's 55%. So as Bitcoin sort of underperforms the rest, the others sort of make their way up for that difference. S&P, this is a log scale chart. Their five-year KGAR 14 and a half, which is double their long-term compound average growth rate, which bothers me deeply. The last time the, the, the S&P had such boom period was the 90s. And you can see some of it coming up down here on the left-hand side. They had an absolute insane period. The market was up 5 or 6 or 700% during the 90s. And then it went sideways for the next 13 years. You can see the peak at dot-com got back there just as the, the global financial crisis happened and then got back there again in mid-2013. In other words, if you had put a dollar into the S&P uh, at the peak in 2001, your dollar was worth a dollar in 2013. I ignoring dividends, I appreciate that. Um, but what we've seen again is a massive run in the S&P. Uh, and that is typically followed by periods of flatlining as it's sort of this is sort of cyclical bear in a sense where, where it doesn't crash, but it just goes sideways so valuations can unwind. 
And here's what I mean. So the blue line here is the trailing 10-year PE, and that, that's of less interest to me. The black line is the trailing uh, one year, and it goes back to 1881, 140 years on the nose. So where we are right, uh, where we are to this graph, which is 2017, is saying, yeah, we're a little bit expensive, et cetera. We get the point and, and the like, but, uh, and there's supposed to be another line coming up and it is beating me, uh, where the trailing is right now, the trailing 12 month PE is up at record levels last seen in the 1990s. In other words, I'm, I'm ignoring that massive spike there because, of course, there was a collapse. There was the 08 09 crisis. We saw a similar for the 20, uh, 2020, the pandemic last year. But in essence, our, the trading PE and even the forward PE on the S&P are both at all-time records with one exception, and that is 2008. Um, and what we saw in 2008 was, uh, even from that period, I mean, we'd had eight years, seven years of unwind, there was still another five years of unwind. The valuation in the US markets bother me. I get software as a service. I get efficiencies. I get productivity. I, I understand all of that. But the valuations that these stocks are trading at, I listen to a podcast from Motley Fool every Friday, uh, and they'll talk about a stock, um, you know, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, it's under 32 PE, not too bad. I don't know, man. A 32 PE, unless you're growing north of 40% a year, a 32 PE is too high. It absolutely is too high. You know, if you're a, 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 a food retailer and you want a 30 plus PE, if you're any sort of retailer, I mean, what are you going to be growing at? 10, 12, maybe 14%? You want a 30 plus PE? To my mind, you are chronically overvalued. There are exceptions. I get that. But broadly, I think the US market is massively overpriced. We'll come back to more of that in a moment. Trade wars, definitely quieter, but then China stomped all over the markets with their idea around common prosperity. China has a national conference in October to elect their leader. Uh, she should, in theory, be standing down because he has served his two terms, but he changed that rule a couple of years ago. Essentially, he is president of China for life until he doesn't want it uh, or until he dies, or maybe they throw him out, but they're not going to vote him out, certainly not next year. And that's, I think, a lot of what he's been doing this year during 2021. The, let's take, for example, the education stocks, which he just banned making money as a third party out of education. And let's be clear, he didn't wake up one Sunday morning, because they always do this on a Sunday, and banned them. They had gone and done household research. When I say household research, they had done research with tens of thousands of households across China, particularly talking to them about education. And there was a very common theme. Parents felt that they had to put their kids into these extra classes in order to succeed, and that the extra classes were costing an absolute fortune and putting a strain both on the family as a unit because of the hours, but also because of the costs involved. So he banned them. Kids playing computer games. You know, he's limited them to one hour uh, on Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, and public holidays. Who, I mean, again, did it with, you know, it, it, to us, as the outsiders, it looks like a sudden shock decision, but this is a process China has been going through. It's a process they've been warning about and talking of, and that comes back to the common, common prosperity. They don't mind some rich oaks. What they don't want is an Elon Musk who could you know, pay off global debt and still have enough money to fly in his spaceship to wherever he wanted to go. They're like, no guys, that's just taking it too far. Remember, China, communist, command economy, yes, tons of democracy and elections and all of that. But ultimately, it's a co command economy, and he's focusing on common prosperity. And this is going to continue next year at a bare minimum because of that conference coming up in October. Is there more that he can stomp on? Well, VIEs. Uh, so you own NASPAS, and NASPAS owns some Tencent. Mm, NASPAS doesn't own Tencent because it's not allowed to, so there's this complex structure which is deeply opaque, which enables foreigners to get the economic uh, benefit from owning Tencent without actually owning Tencent. Uh, and there are now uh, announcements made in the last two days, in fact, I think yesterday, that they are going to be stomping down on that uh, fairly post-haste. So, and what they're going to do 
is they're not going to unwind the existing. So your 10 cents are fine. But they're going to say in future, you can't use these. These are dodgy ways to, and in essence, there is a law in China that says foreigners can't own Chinese companies. And these, these uh, VIEs are circumventing the law. Anyone surprised that there's going to be crackdowns on them? As I said, he's not going to go and ban the VIEs for Alibaba, JD.com, uh, Didi, who knows, uh, Tencent, et cetera, et cetera. But there might be some more shakes coming there. China is not going quietly. China wants to be the global economic, uh, social, and military superpower. That is their aim. I mean, who doesn't? I mean, which country is like, nah, you know what? We're happy sitting down here in our corner down here. That's what countries want. Uh, and uh, they will succeed. I mean, this is our future. China will be a global economic uh, and social superpower. They are already a military superpower. The UK, look, they got Brexit done, I suppose. Kudos to them. But they still got Boris Johnson. Uh, and you know what? I can't take Boris Johnson seriously, and I can't take the UK seriously. So... And they're muddling along. They are finding it a little bit harder than they thought post-Brexit. They're now having to make special special dispensation to allow to allow non-UK truck drivers come into the country. But the, isn't that exactly what Brexit didn't want? Year, uh, rain. So we're looking for another wet season uh, in in uh, South Africa, Australia, and the likes. Uh, we're looking for uh, La Nina which as opposed to El Nino, which is the dry, this is going to be wet. We are expecting, and the evidence on the ground from crop planting so far, uh, and what we've seen with moisture content in the ground, is that we're going to have another really good season. Normally in agriculture, when you have a lot of rain and you have a good season, prices come down because of supply overwhelms the demand, which is relatively inelastic. Supply booms, price comes down. Prices are down a bit, but we've still got white and yellow maize north of 3,000. We've got sunflower north of 11,000, uh, uh, miller's wheat north of 6,000 a ton. These numbers are giant, not because there hasn't been a large uh, uh, yield, but because globally it's been spotty and because of supply chains and all of that. So prices have remained high. Citrus had its best year ever and is on track to have as good a year again. The problem is input costs for farmers are rising. Fertilizer, diesel, electricity. All of those costs are rising. If you're in America, labor at the same time. So they are being squeezed on their margins. Infrastructure starting to happen locally, globally as well. The U.S., uh, companies like Marion Roberts, which will benefit from Australia and the U.S., Robex, certainly we're starting to see the infrastructure happening. Our local uh, construction, uh, uh, sort of second-tier construction companies, reporting best activity that they've seen since the 80s. We've had a sector that has largely not happened since the 2010 World Cup. All that flurry up to the World Cup, and since then it's faded away. Leisure. Uh, so I've actually been buying some leisure stocks, and we will talk on that in a bit. But leisure actually looking not bad. Uh, I know. Omni uh, Omicron, I know. Lockdowns, etc., etc. But take, uh, take City Lodge. Published an update, I think, on Thursday, and then, of course, on Friday, the world locked us out. Um, they were doing 45% occupancies from the beginning of November, so for the 26 days, 25 days to that update. Their break-even pre-pandemic was around 35%, um, but I imagine they've managed to squeeze their cost base, so their break-even is now probably 28 to 30%. They were doing 45 Now. The wheels have fallen off a bit. We'll talk more about that. But the, 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 the pandemic hasn't yet left us, and there's truthfully a lot more that we don't know. So let's go to some predictions for the year ahead. Top 40. Our top 40 is cheap. PE of around 12, dividend yield of 3.9. Now, that is helped in very large part by resources. That is the, the resource stocks, your Sabanya Stillwaters, your Implats, your Anglo Platinum, your Kumba Iron Ore, your, I mean, th th those couple of stocks on their own, uh, their mid-year dividends was, what, 100 billion, 120 billion, just their dividends. So that has boosted it. So it is cheap, but it's cheap thanks to the resources. If we strip them out, we get our PE of around 14, a dividend yield of around two and a half, which is around fair value. Um, I think our top 40 can have a decent year, but it's going to take a lot of heavy lifting from some of the other stocks because I'm not sure we're going to get it from resources. I think the resource stocks such as the Implats, the Kumbas, Sabanias, et cetera, et cetera, 
are pricing in the current commodity prices. I, th I think their pricings are currently fair. And I think commodities can broadly hold where they are. Uh, and we're still going to see, therefore, some great dividends. The risk is a little more sinking in particularly the PGMs. As I said, GDP back to 2819 by the end of this year. Uh, resources being the driver, now they are the risk. I like banks. I like some industrials. I like low LSM retail. Uh, remember, banks like inflation. We've got some solid uh, industrial and I lower LSMs. Uh, think Pep, think Mr. Lewis, think uh, Mr. Price, sorry, Lewis, Mr. Price, think ShopRite have been absolutely knocking it out the park and picking up market share. From who? From independents or perhaps from the higher LSM space. So industrials, Aspen, uh, they got, they made the announcement, was a Tuesday, they've now got permission to manufacture the Johnson & Johnson. Previously, they were doing fill and finish, 300 million doses a year at their Kobecha facility down in the Eastern Cape. Um, and now they can, they're can. they doing it under their own brand name. They'll make 1.3 billion uh, per year. It seems the trend with the boosters seems to be that what we're going to see is probably annual boosters maybe biannual, at least for the next couple of years. This is, the vaccine business is a 75 to 100 billion, rephrase that, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine business is a 75 to 100 billion dollar industry that didn't exist this time last year. It is massive. Aspen locally is benefiting it from it. The stock is cheap. Globally, uh, Moderna, of course, Johnson & Johnson, of course, my pick of the globals is Pfizer. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is going to break into two. That will make it more attractive. You can get the sort of home products the, or you can get the medical. Um, I've never liked medical. I've always worried about regulatory risk, but I think they've got a short window where they can, a little bit of price gouging, you know, $20, $25 for a vaccine for while well, we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic. People aren't going to be too reticent about that. But at some point, they will start to. So I think they, that, that the regulatory risk will return, but I think that's a couple of years away. We're seeing values in industrials. That update from Bidcorp. Here's one of the weird things that we have seen as a result of the pandemic. It has decimated a lot of companies. Gone bankrupt, struggled to survive, laid off staff, reduced sizes, et cetera, et cetera. We know all of those stories. But a lot of other companies have actually come out of it stronger. They got rid of non-core assets, in some cases at decent prices. They reduced uh, uh, workforces. They uh, uh, improved efficiencies. Uh, uh, Invicta, for example, reduced their, their, their uh, inventories from 2 billion to 1 billion. And that's a giant number. It's an absolutely giant number. A lot of companies have come out of this stronger. Also because they were already leaders in a sense in their space. Now, Victor and Omnia were both turnarounds already. Uh, and those had started sort of pre-pandemic. But they really have knocked it out the park. And they've fixed their balance sheets. They've fixed their business. And they're looking for new areas to invest into uh, and the like. Bidcorp, global uh, food services, Definitely picking up market share, picking up revenue, expanding markets. Like it a lot. Invicta, uh, they basically sell yellow equipment, parts, supplies, and the like. They're moving into fiber, telecoms, 5G, that sort of thing with ac acquisition of dot-com. Uh, Interesting, I spoke to um, Stephen Joffe, the new CEO. Well, he's been there a couple of years now. Uh, last week or so with uh, when the results came out. I asked him about why no mid-year dividend, and he said no. The dot-com deal, they've promised the sellers who are getting cash and equity a 5 rand 15 dividend over the first three years of ownership. And they expect to have done that deal by the time their, their, their year end comes around, which will be March. Uh, and therefore, they will then be part of that deal, which means that they are almost promising, assuming they can, 5 rand 15 of dividend over the next three years for a stock that's trading around 25 rand at this point in time. Omnia, problem with Omnia, they've got a billion rand tax dispute with SARS hanging over their head. They can afford to pay it. It's not nice. The bigger story with Omnia is uh, fertilizer, explosives. 
we're going to have another bumper crop that's going to be great for fertilizer. Huge input is ammonia. And they the supplies around that. They have got their supply. They get it secundo from Sasso, and then they've got import. So they've got security of supply. Uh, mining, we'll see how the volumes go there. But I think miners are, you know, even at platinum at 950, palladium 1700, rhodium 13,000. PGMs at those prices are, as I said, second best that they've seen. These miners are going to be producing as much as they can at those price points. So Omnia explosives and fertilizer uh, looking very, very strong. Financials, cheap, uh, around price to book. Inflation, not bad for banks, gives them wiggle room. Uh, prime, we might get another increase next year, taking us to seven and a half. I don't see it going much beyond that. I've always liked Capitec, uh, held it for 14 years, 13 years, long time. Uh, always expensive, but then it always just goes up. Uh, for me, the easy one is the Satrix Finney ETF. I hold that in my tax-free account at the moment. And then Purple Group, easy equities. I got to say, the results which came out recently to end of August surprised me by their strength. I thought that we would see revenue by client by clients uh, per client declining. We had seen it the JSC. I mean, the volumes of last year were not going to be, have not been repeated this year. We've seen that from PSG Consult. We've seen it from the JSC numbers, etc. Except that not only did they knock it out the park and they've got 727,000 active accounts, but they're actually managed to hold the, the 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 revenue per client at about 60 odd bucks and Charles Savage made a great point to me which is that what you've got is a is a is a uh, your your older clients you've not older in age but older in terms of how long they've been with equity easy equities are actually more valuable they make more money makes sense right you're getting a little bit richer you're making profits you're getting a little more confident in what you do so as the age profile of those clients starts to shift you'll see easy equities actually manage to push that revenue up and their cost of acquisition is sub 50 in other words client is profitable in year one it's absolutely ridiculous i call it the punt it's probably not fair i call it a punt because the stocks run quite hard and and is seeing some weakness at the point but if you if you see a sudden sell off if you see a sudden price collapse uh opportunity grab yourself some anywhere around two bucks i think it's a good price for that resource stocks not massively bullish i think they're going to continue to spin massive dividends uh pgms it's really about when vehicle manufacturing gets back to normal my preferred in the space is sabania uh iron ore parties over but you know at 90 to 100 dollars uh we're still seeing Kumba with a, 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 an operating margin of 60%. I mean, that's not shabby. Gold runners over unless vaccines start to fail. Uh, 1860 is the important level. Keeps them trying and failing at that point. Coal, I, I like the coal miners. I like the coal price. The problem is they simply can't get their coal to Richards Bay Coal Terminal, and therefore they can't get it out the country. So they, they can't make the level of money that they could otherwise be making. Retailers, quality and well positioned. ShopRite, always, always ShopRite. Uh, ShopRite, you know, in the olden days, when I was learning about markets back in the 80s and 90s, the rule of markets was the first share you bought was Anglo, the second share you bought was Anglo, and then the third share was pick and pay. Um, now, I think the rule is first share you buy is ShopRite, second share you buy is ShopRite. That uh, last trading update from them was absolutely superb. If you contrast it to pick and pay, uh, if you contrast it to SPA, if you contrast it to Woolies, they are killing the competition, hands down. Discam, you know what I really like about Discam? So I never liked Discam's valuation. I don't like the Discam store. You go into a drugstore and they give you a trolley, and that just blows my mind. I'm here to buy Panado and you give me a trolley. Um, and then you're buying all your healthy stuff, right? You put all your healthy stuff and then the last hundred yards is that zigzag of the queue and it's the unhealthy stuff. It's the sweets. It's like, it just, it disconnects my brain. Anyway, that's a personal anecdote of no import. They're moving into health, not just your Panados and prescriptions. They're doing telemedicine. So here's how Discam looks to see, how I see it in five years time that you're feeling unwell, 
You know what a doctor's visit is? What, 500,000 bucks, bang, medical aid never pays because you've maxed out your medical aid by Valentine's Day. So your doctor's a thousand bucks and, and that's a big, large amount of money. People can't afford it in many cases. But you go to a disc and they'll hit you up a doctor for 300 bucks. It'll be a nurse and she can do it all. And if you need some extra, they'll telemedicine you in. And then you need some drugs, they write you the script, bang, you buy them right there and then. They're also going to be bringing some insurance in, uh, not at the medical aid thing, which is, you know, thousands of rands per member, but trying to bring it in at sub thousand rand a member. Uh, they're onto something there, which I think is going to be huge. Uh, local, low, uh, LSM retail, Pepco, Mr. Price, Lewis. Lewis, knocking it out. I, I've never liked Lewis. I've always said, you know what, they're a bank that masquerades as a, as, as a, as a as a retailer, um, but they, they, their results have been absolutely knocking it out. Pepco, another company. So Pepco is the ShopRite in clothing. You know, the innovation that we've seen coming out. Back to ShopRite. So we all know about their 6060. Um, they've also quietly on the side, if you've got their extra savings card, that's now a banking card. Um, and you can now use it for, for banking. Interestingly, backending that is Grinrod which is perhaps an industrial you should be looking at. Grinrod Bank. And Grinrod Bank, excuse me, did the SASA via cash payments. And there was all dodgy stuff happening, but it wasn't it wasn't happening at the Grinrod level. It was happening at the CPS level. Uh, so Pepco, absolutely, I, by a long way. Uh, property, still tough out there. Brilliant presentation. Uh, Ahmed uh, Morari from uh, Stanlib, Stanlib did for us uh, three or four weeks ago. You'll find it. Go have a look at just one lap. It's, you're seeing it up there in the top uh, right. Office remains very tough. We saw the Amara update the other day or yesterday. Uh, yeah, yesterday. Office is still struggling. Work from home remains unknown. I think what we're going to start to see next year is a lot of the larger companies bringing staff back three, four days a week. Uh, coupled with vaccine mandates, but many are in better shape, and this is the point that's made in the in, in the Power Hour we did a, a, a two weeks ago from um, Ahmed. And, and prior to well, our, our property market peaked in 2017-ish, so well ahead of the pandemic. And the problem with our with our listed property stocks was that they were trading at massive multiples to net asset value. 30, in some cases, 40% premium to net asset value. They had pushed their loan to value, loan covenants, right to the edge, 45, 50, in some cases, 55%. And because of their, their, their premium to net asset value, they'd gone and raised money by issuing script, and they'd gone and bought some B-grade assets, to be perfectly honest. And that needed to unwind itself. And it was starting to happen to a degree, and it absolutely the pandemic made it happen. Suddenly, they're having to 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 manage debt. Suddenly, they're trading at discounts to to net asset pre, uh, net asset value rather than premiums. Suddenly, they all care about loan to values. They're getting rid of their their B grades. I mean, we're talking you know property companies. You've got rid of in some cases you know billions and billions and billions of buildings, and they've had to sell them at a about eight or nine percent yields, which uh, they might have bought them at maybe slightly higher yields, uh, but nonetheless, they they what they, what they certainly they've they've cleaned up. I think a property sector, and I'm parking office off to its own little corner. I think the property sector is in a much better shape than it probably has been at any point in the last four years. I hold the core shares property ETF. I like it. I like it because it uses yield as its uh, 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 metric, um, and with a lot of companies just dividends being slashed, or as you saw with Rebosis, just not paid, yield becomes important. Leisure, hurting, new variant. I'm going to come a little more to the variant in a moment, so I'll park that there for now. Let me just keep an eye on my timings. Timing's looking good. Um, yes, that's what I'm seeing. New variant, I'll come to that in a bit. Things were looking better. I, met, I mentioned City Lodge, who had got to their 45% uh, uh, occupancies and then absolutely collapsed in a heap. On Friday, when things were collapsing, I was buying City Lodge and Sun International. There should be an asterisk on the Sun International. Uh, four rand entry on City Lodge, 21 rand on Sun International. I liked Soho. In fact, I prefer Soho uh, uh, gaming and hotels. 
but I didn't get the I couldn't get the prices I wanted. Um, listen to my podcast from this morning, JC Direct, just one left, dot com slash JC Direct. I talk about being ready so that when the collapse comes, you know what you want and you know the price that you want to pay. They're both looking like inspired buys right now, you know, four trading days later. Time will tell. But this isn't for me a quick trade. This is something that I will probably hold for a couple of years, at least a year or 18 months, maybe three or four years. In other words, I'm going to hold it through fourth waves and fifth waves and out the pandemic at the other end. City Lodge, less hard hit in occupancies because I think a lot of our foreign tourists who come in with euros and sterlings and dollars, yeah, I'm staying at a City Lodge, man. You can stay at a Radisson Blue and it's still like it's, you know same price as a pie and chips at the pub back at home. So I think City Lodge, less hard hit. Sun International also, they've got some of the higher end hotels, but not as much. The big thing is I'm expecting Ramaphosa to speak this Sunday, maybe next, probably this, more lockdown restrictions. What's he going to do? I don't think he's going to ban interprovincial travel. I think he's going to reduce uh, group sizes and I think he's going to uh, squeeze the curfew. That's going to hurt restaurants, secure, uh, you know, your, your Spurs, two degree famous brands and the like, but your holiday destinations, I think he's going to leave. He, he, our economy is too fragile at this point. Small mid caps, lots of valuations. Uh, we're going to see a lot of results surprises. I suspect we've seen a bunch of them, a lot to avoid. I, I still like Metrofile. I think there's still potentially a buyout there. Santova, you know, when things were collapsing last year, I sold some stocks. One of them was City Lodge. I think I got out of 56 bucks. I sold a whole bunch of stocks. A lot of them were really good sales. One of them was a horror sale, Santova. Sold it at two rand. I looked across this pandemic at lockdowns and thought, a logistics company in this? Don't want to touch it. I was 100% wrong. I'm also interested in the, the Baldwins of the world. I'm interested in the Calgary M3s, the housing. But I need to see some 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 more positivity in the results coming through from those stocks. Interest rates did an event last week. You can go find it on justonelap.com. Uh, looking at particularly U.S. inflation. Inflation is back. Transitory. Janet Yellen today said transitory is a word they should retire. Jerome Powell on Tuesday said transitory is no longer applicable. Oil is busy as we are, as I'm presenting, collapsing below $70 for Brent uh, as OPEC Plus agrees to hike production 400,000 barrels a day from January. But Asterix, they are at short notice, can review. But we're seeing wage increases, we're seeing supply chains, we're seeing base effects, we're seeing demand. I'm not going to go into it. There's a whole 40 minute video that you can catch on the website. Um, the question is, what about interest rates? So we've, I think we've probably got at max one more in South Africa. I think the US has to start raising rates by about mid-year. There's the meetings, May, June, July. I think it's probably a June, July that we will start to see. If you are looking for income, uh, the government retail bonds are looking quite attractive. They tipped it up. That's now the five years at 9.75. Uh, and the 10-year inflation linked is at 4.5%. And how that works is your capital increases every every six months by the CPI, and then they pay 4.5% on top. I don't expect, in fact, if anything, I think South African inflation is going to be moderating slightly lower. I think U.S. inflation is coming down. I think this time next year, U.S. inflation is probably going to be about 3%. It's well above their 2% uh, uh, target. But I think South African inflation this time next year is going to be back around and a half percent particularly if oil stays under pressure if oil stays where it is right now and the rand stays where it is right now our oil price our petrol price comes down between 10 and 15 percent on the first wednesday in january um and uh we will see i think a lot of the inflationary pressure coming out there's no demand in our economy so where's the inflation coming from supply chains and logistics we could talk about this for days and ends. And if you want some really deep dives on it, go find the podcast called Odd Locks, Odd Lot, Odd Lots. Uh, Joe's, Joe Weisenthal and uh, Tracy Elloway from, uh, Elloway from Bloomberg uh, Weekly Podcast. They've done a lot in this space. There is a lot happening here. Is it starting to improve? A little bit. Is it back to normal? Not by a long way. Do we ever get back to our just in time? Uh, uh, Supply chain, supply global supply chains. I think not. I think companies have been quite spooked by what we've seen. This is uh, 
Long Beach and uh, uh, LA uh, harbors in, in the US, the wait times here are longer than they've ever been in the history of the harbors by a factor of 3x. But things are slowly starting to improve. But there's still issues. There's still there's an outbreak of COVID in a harbor in China and they shut the harbor down for 10 days and that just ripples through the, the supply chains. So I think we're still, it'll improve over the course of next year. I'm not sure we're going to be perfectly back to to pre-pandemic by the end of next year. China flexing their muscle, common prosperity, she up in the third term, he'll get it, that's no problem. US being a strong 2021 for large caps and tech. As I said, I, I'm calling US negative for the year next year. S&P is expensive and being supported by a few large techs. I'm not saying it's going to collapse. I'm just saying you're going to get 0% return at best. European Union, yeah, look, I was supposed to be landing in Paris in a little over two weeks' time. So the European Union can go and take their, their union and, and do whatever they need to. It's muddling along. I mean, France, for example, the CAC, CAC around 40 uh, made a new all-time high. The previous all-time high was in 2000, 21 years later. Uh, Germany, change of, of, of transition of leadership going smoothly. I think they, along with America or parts of America, are large-scale messing up the uh, uh the pandemic france is back to 50,000 cases a day come on guys i mean like and i know high vaccine rates which mean death rates are low etc cetera, etc cetera. but 50,000 a day it, it's a country the same population as ours we've never got more than 30,000 i mean they just no man so the pandemic i think the worst is behind us and those are very possibly f famous last words the Omic omicron variant I mean, it's early days. The world didn't know about it seven days and four hours ago. Truthfully, they did. They just elected to pretend it wasn't there. It turns out it was everywhere as well as South Africa. Just We, we have really good genome sequencing due to uh, TBX, uh, extreme TB, and HIV in South Africa. Our, our sequence, genome sequencing in this country is not even world class. It's just as good as it can be, and other countries aspire to be us. Uh, hence, we found it. I'm seeing a lot of early takes on, on the new variant, and I think it's too early. The early takes are that the vaccines work, but it, it, it's a lot more transmittable. Um, sure, I, I mean, your new variant is almost certainly going to be more transmittable, isn't it? Because uh, it has to beat Delta. For it to survive, it, for it to be, become the dominant variant, it has to outperform Delta, which had to outperform Beta, which had to outperform Alpha. So, of course, it has to be more transmissible. The question is, how do the, 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 um, the vaccines work and, and what is the implication for unvaccinated? How, how bad is hospitalization? A lot of people are saying, oh, look, cases are spiking and hospitals aren't. But we need more data. We'll know more in two or three weeks. We'll know more in January. At this point, I think it's too early. Point being is that we've got the vaccines rolling. We've got folks like Moderna, the CEO of Moderna, who stood up on was it Wednesday and said, oh, these vaccines won't work in the new variant. He is talking nonsense. He does not know. But what we've also got is the CEO of Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer saying, look, if the vaccines aren't as efficient, we can tweak them. No worries. We can make little tweaks. We can make a plan, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think We've got to the point where we are now able to, in every single calendar year, make two vaccines for every person on planet Earth. Now, the logistics of getting it to that person and the logistics of that person accepting it, different debates entirely, but a year ago that wasn't the case. And this year that wasn't the case. We ha simply haven't made enough. Um, so it's a long walk out of the woods. There's still going to be new variants coming, but I, 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 economy is recovering, but quickly, people recovering slowly. There's a lot still to come from it. But I, whereas a year ago, this time last year, even though we had the, the first vaccines being put in arms, it was dark and gloomy. Notwithstanding my, my three-week holiday in, in France is cancelled, and I'm probably facing lockdowns over Christmas, New Year, I, I weirdly enough think that we're in a feeling more positive about it than I did a year ago. Let me put it at that point. So some stocks. There's a lot of stocks that are not on this list. I've mentioned some that are worth looking at. Grinrod, uh, 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 Baldwin, uh, Colgro M3, uh, Metrofile, Santova, PPC. There's always lots of stocks not on the list. Food retailers, ShopRite. Enough said. 
Financials, I like the Citrix Finney. I hold it. I like Purple Group. Uh, Purple Group, I'd, if you're looking to buy, I, I would like to say sub two rand. I don't know if it gets there, but I think it might. Uh, resources, Sabanya. My Sabanya position has shrunk over the course of the year as my portfolio has grown and Sabanya grew and shrunk and I'm comfortable with it. I'm not sure it's going to knock it out the park, but it's kind of like, just in case I'm wrong on resources, let me have myself some Sabanyas. Uh, retail, ShopRite, and then Diskim and Lewis. Uh, Diskim and Lewis, absolutely. And just, uh, infrastructure, Robex, Marion Roberts. Robex, uh, Rudolf Free is rocking and rolling. Marion Roberts, Locally, they don't have a heck of a lot. They've got some infrastructure, but they don't have any IP, uh, so they struggle to compete in the renewable energy space. But they they can do some stuff in the water. They've kept the, the, the they've kept the staff, so they've got the the capacity. Uh, Australia's doing great for them. They recently did a deal in the US, which gives them exposure into the US. It's about half a billion czar, uh, 500 million rand. They can pay it cash. Uh, but what we're seeing with them is the U.S. is going to be very, very tough. Uh, it was their 73rd AGM this morning. They gave an update. They're clocking about two to two and a half billion of revenue a month. Uh, so let's call that. That's about let's call it 27 odd billion for the for the year. As fast as they are ending projects, new projects are coming in. So their order book is still growing. At 27 billion, uh, they did about 21, 22 for the last financial year. But they still had some legacy projects that were costing them a fortune, discontinued operations. Those are now out of the equation. Um, I was buying 10, 10, 50. I still like Marion Roberts. I think it's still got upside. Uh, Leisure, City Lodge, Sun International touched on my logic behind those. Th these are not short-term punts. And if there's significant weakness, I use it for entries. Property, avoid direct offers. I always with property. I never buy the individual stocks. I, I just go and buy the ETF. I like the core shares property ETF. Some 2020 big ideas. I think you will see US S&P 500 red for the year. Maybe more famous last words, but we've got to put some heads on blocks, right? This is my last presentation for the year. Good local harvest, high prices. Um, it's going to hurt food producers. Folks who will benefit from this, TWK, COP Agri, uh, those sort of folks who, who go into it. Uh, Omnia, those sort of companies are the ones I think we're going to see benefiting nicely from that. As I said, input costs hurting. Uh, I think this time next year, my very, very bold prediction is that this time next year, we can have this event live at the JSC again. And that perhaps is my biggest, boldest present event. I, it's weird. I've traveled for 20 years, you know, 50, 100 flights a year. And then suddenly March 4th last year, ground to a halt. Uh, I haven't traveled for work subsequent. Um, did, done a trip to Durban and Cape Town in the last couple of weeks. But aside from that, I, I, I miss the live presenting. I don't miss the having to schlep off to Durban and Cape Town. I miss Durban and Cape Town. I miss my friends. I miss the cities. Um, but the airports and stuff was not thrillingly exciting. And of course, now I have a 6.30 radio show. So school nights for me. So no late nights going to Durban and Cape Town. Anyway, I hope... That is the one that's right, that we can do this event live next year. Top 40, I think, will be green for the year. I'm expecting the rand weaker next year, unless commodities surprise. I think we're going to see a weaker rand in 2022. Not massively, but I think a little bit undoubtedly. Your ETFs, your long-term ETFs, your tax-free account, max it out first. Don't stress it. If you're an ETF investor and you're saying, yeah, you didn't... That's fine. Just buy the ETFs. I buy the global. I've got some of the Satrix Finney in there. I've got some of the core shares property, uh, etc. Don't, 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 don't stress. I mean, this is a, a fun presentation, but don't rush out and do it. I do go back to what I said right up front this evening, which is that if if your stock picking this year didn't have an excellent year, you need to revisit your methodologies. Uh, this should have been a year where stock pickers beat the market by a mile. Uh, and if you haven't, I mean, the, 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 the top 40 is up 23 odd percent. Um, my portfolio is probably up 48, 49. Last time I checked, it was a little over 50, but we've had a red day or two. Although I was green. Anyway, so, yeah, I'm 2x ahead of portfolio of market. That's what it should have been for you. Your tax free, always max that out first. Your reg 28, tax those tax benefits before you do discretionary. And that's it. I'll see if there are some questions. I've only got a minute and a half left. Uh, there are some questions coming through. Vanessa, NASPAS and Process, are they a sell? 
I don't hold them individually because I hold Satrix 40 and they've got such a giant waiting in that. I wouldn't say they are a sell, no. And in fact, I'm going to get someone on my radio show, MoneyWeb Now, on Monday morning who actually rates Tencent a big buy. I think they're not a sell. I'm not sure they're going to knock it out the park. I think there's still worries around China, justified or otherwise. I think if you've held them through to this point, no, not a sell. Uh, Eldrick, you're asking easy equities. Yep, purple, like it a lot. Uh, someone's asking me price target for easy equities. So let's roll some numbers. Charles Savage says they've got an investable market of, say, 7.5 million. Let's say they get half of them. Let's say 3 million because it makes my math easier. Uh, so they've got 3 million that they can tap into over the next, say, it takes them 5 years, 10 years. Let's call it 5 years. They get 3 million customers. Just on the easy equities, they're already making 50 a person. It gets to, say, 80 rand a person. Uh, throw in some other bits and pieces, EC10, et cetera, et cetera. They just call it 100 rand a person. Uh, so they make 100 rand per client. They've got 3 million clients. That's 30 million. That's 300 million. Uh, what does it trade at? Uh, 300 million profit. Let's put it on a 20 PE, 3 billion, 6 billion. That is a, I mean, it's potentially a 10 rand share. That back of the envelope got me to around six rand, seven rand share. Uh, Chris, emerging markets. Yeah, you know, I I get enough emerging markets directly and indirectly. And, and my ETFs, I just buy the global uh, from core shares. I did a great interview earlier in this week with Peter van der Ross. Go have a look for it on MoneyWare. Peter van der Ross, R-O-S-S, um, around emerging markets. The theory in the 80s and 90s around emerging markets was that they had a structural advantage to developed markets and you would see returns as a result. And the evidence says that is not true. Is Sassel a sell? If uh, oil is going weaker, yes, Sassel is a sell. Uh, Ashburton 500, still the, it was an Ashburton 1200. So I'm buying global because it's slightly cheaper, but I've also still got the Ashburton 1200. Love it. I like the large, diverse global, which includes emerging market. That's why I like the Ashburton. That's why I like the global from Core Shares. Time Bank, Time Bank is coming. Look, do not buy uh, African Rainbow Capital. It is a value trap of epic note. The valuations on their assets, most notably Rain, is insane. Time Bank is coming, but Time Bank's not the only one. Pick and pay, uh, sorry, ShopRite's launching a bank. Um, the problem is, if I could invest directly into Time, maybe. I can't, I won't buy African Rainbow Capital. Uh, Pepco is the ShopRite of clothing retailers. Just that ShopRite in the food space is best of breed globally. In terms of margins, efficiencies, and what they can do. I was thinking the other day, you know what ShopRite could do? They could replace the post office, right? Because they've got distribution centers everywhere dotted around. They've got stores everywhere. Who needs the post office? Go post your letters at ShopRite. I mean, stuff like that. I mean, 6060 is just the beginning. Their, their new bank product, which isn't a bank, so you don't need Fika, just the beginning. And Pepco is the same. Pepco has got a delivery product. They delivered, what was it, three and a half million parcels, cheap, cheap, store to store. Pepcor is as efficient and as good and as well run and ultimately as profitable and as big as uh, ShopRite. Infrastructure developing stocks, Stefanuti, Avenge. Stefanuti, no, bankrupt. Avenge, they're consolidating. Yes, that will see weakness. Go to uh, justonelap.com, search for Avenge. I did a podcast on what I do and don't like about it and what's going to happen with the consolidation. I don't like them. I don't hold them. I prefer Marion Robertson Robex. But if you do want them, understand. I expect weakness when that consolidation happens. But Zippo are well spotted for at least knowing it's happening because most people are going to wake up on the morning of and they're going to see their shares have risen and they're going to think they've made a fortune. They haven't. Eldrick Steinhoff, stay away. It's a piece of nonsense. It's technically bankrupt. Um, no, the core shares, Jane, is a local. The property one is SYGP from Signia, which is a global one. Core shares has one too. The Signia is cheaper. Uh, yeah, Steinhoff, no. Uh, Bankrupt. I mean, yeah, they've got some Pepco and stuff. No, you don't want to own stuff. Yeah, we, we can go and buy some of the best companies in the world on our exchange at great multiples. Uh, Steinhoff is neither. Uh, how does MTN? Yeah, so I thought long and hard about MTN, and then I saw oil collapsing. MTN is looking very good. Depends how low oil goes. Um, because they operate in a lot of oil economies, most notably Nigeria. Uh, but they've got a much better management team in place. I sold my MTNs in 2017 when they, you know, when your regulator comes and says, do something, you do it. Instead, they said to the regulator, see, he has a middle finger. 
You don't do that. That's why they got a five and a half billion dollar US fine. Um, there's always going to be a regulatory risk in that environment, but I think they're in a much better position. I just think with oil lower, they might start to see some squeezings on some of their revenues. If you want to hold a, a telco, it's probably MTN, although Vodacom's looking interesting with their acquisition uh, of the Egyptian business. Um, Egyptian, yep, Egyptian. And then there's one more that Vodafone has. Is it Ghana? I think it's Ghana. Um, and that then gives Vodacom a lot more bulk. But of the two, I think that uh, MTN's better. Telcom is interesting because they've got some assets that they will spin out in time, and that will be a value unlock. But that's just a classic value, value unlock play. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. Uh, as always, take care of yourself. If you can, look after somebody else as well. We are not out of the pandemic. It is still crazy out there. So keep safe in 2022. Hopefully, we do this next December at the JSC Live. I will take the next day off for radio shows so we can have some drinks afterwards. Contact details, you're welcome to find me up on the Twitters and the emails and the like, and of course, disclaimers. Ladies and gents, everyone have a great holidays. If you're working, if you're in hospitality, if you're in emergency services, you're in retail, thank you. Somebody has to carry on running this country while the rest of us are on holiday. If you are on holiday, be safe, look after yourself, uh, and uh, yeah, wear your mask, wash your hands, all those things that we've been talking about now for the last 20 months. Cheers all.